and welcome to Thrift Shop Biography. This is the one about the Beastie Boys. Thank you for listening. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm great. How are you? So, yeah, good. So this week we've been reading a book all about the Beastie Boys. Yeah, I've been waiting five years to get hold of this book. <laughs> I think it came out five years ago, but it was really expensive. It certainly wasn't in charity shops, thrift yeah, shops. Lucky to find it. Yes. So you're a Beastie Boys fan? Yes, I am, but not as much as my brother. Okay. And I would say that the only reason I really know them is because I had a brother. He, he was, was a Beastie Boy. He was, and he's just the right age. So, yeah, of yeah, course. It's... Yeah. Did your brother steal the emblem off a Volkswagen car? No, but he did <laughs> skateboard a lot. <laughs> yeah. And threw himself into bushes and all this. It's like, uh, well, no. <laughs> did the Beastie Boys used to throw themselves oh into my bushes? God, no, but on an immediate tangent, it's jackass, right? I really link it. And I had a total revelation when this bloke Spike Jones was working on their videos. And then I Googled him and found out that he was one of the two men behind jackass. Ah, jackass go. being that. Punk, the thing where punk isn't just music, it's a state of mind. It's a lifestyle. It is. How about you? No, don't like them. That. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. Oh, really? No, because we didn't discuss this at all. We're like, here's the next book. Yeah. No. Oh, I was interested to read the book. Yeah. I'm interested in them as a phenomenon. It's not really been my type of music, although I found out through the book it kind of is, actually. Oh, you so realize... that's an interesting thing about ah. it. I didn't think they were for me, but through reading the book, I found out actually they are. Wow. But did you know a lot of their music? You... No, I just knew the big album in the 80s, Licensed to Ill, and I'm oh. really opposed to that kind of very laddish, aggressive behaviour and language, which I find out through reading this book actually is, was never their intention, no, but we'll got... get to that. Yeah. But because of that... I've never really liked them. Wow. And have you been listening to a few of their later stuff through yeah. reading this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you like it? Yeah, I do. It gets so funky and so mellow. Well, it's, it's everything. It, it, goes, it goes all over the shop. It's everything. Yeah. Actually, I really love bands and artists who switch genres. Yeah. And they're 30 years into their career, they're still experimenting yeah. with sound. And These are yeah. musical scientists, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, so that is a revelation to me from right. reading this book. So I started this book not really caring much about them and i i'm not a fan but i'm interested in what they do yeah 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 they're not dumbasses are they well (laughs) no they're not they're They're not not. they're not which is annoying because when they first hit big yeah they came across as dumbasses yeah so should we get into it yes (laughs) (laughs) so the beastie boys are in new york city yes and they are rappers as we know them, but actually they were punk. Yeah. So this is these are the things that have really blown my mind. The fact that they were punk first, the fact they were so young, they were 15 yeah. when their first record came out. They were kids. And the third thing is they came from really nice homes. Yes. Upper middle, I don't know, artistic parents, yeah. all three. Yeah. It's amazing how they all came together. A lot of people do when they have similar backgrounds. All of their parents had in common... They were really left-wing and really artistic. Shall I actually say who was what? Mike D, Michael Diamond. His parents were art dealers and they lived on Central Park West. Yeah, they got the money. Yeah, and he grew up with like really legendary paintings hanging on his walls, mm-hmm. like art gallery standard famous painters on their walls. Ad Rock, Adam Horowitz... His dad was a playwright and wrote the first... Now, they didn't say this in the book, I googled him. He wrote a play that was Al Pacino's first play oh, that he acted wow. in. He went on to be in eight of his dad's plays. Wow. Al Pacino. So really well connected. And then MCA, Adam Yauch, grew up in Brooklyn Heights in a big brownstone. Mm-hmm. And his dad was an architect. His mother was a social worker. So, I mean, wow, they're not gangster rappers. Yeah. They didn't come up from the streets. Yes. But they then left their houses to grow up on the streets of New York. It's like the next parent was New York City. Yeah, for sure. And I kind of was quite jealous of them reading this because they got to be teenagers in early 1980s New York. I mean, how much I know. And what all their parents had in common was they all said to them, you are... Totally free to roam as long as you don't let your schoolwork slide. 
Yeah. You are literally free to go and be whatever you want to be, come home whenever you want, as long as you keep up your schoolwork. And they all did that. Yeah, so they were good boys from good families who just went out and had a great time in the music scene in New York City. And they were all punks to begin yeah. with. That's... They weren't faking that. They weren't like posh boys Oh, I've looked at punk. videos of them they on were YouTube. They were punks. They were proper... They were proper like noise boys. polluted yeah, punks. Yeah, yeah they the really were. The music that I listened to on YouTube was almost unlistenable. <laughs> yeah. They were that punk in the <laughs> yeah. beginning. I mean, I loved it. It's just so much energy. Yeah. But yeah, there's no mistaking that they were proper little punks. What better place to be a punk than 19... Well, other than 1970s London, where yeah. it began. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you can't get there, be a 15-year-old punk in 1980s New York. Yeah. I mean, they were born, right, respectively, 1964, 65 and 66. And they thought Adam Yauk was so much older than them. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, really wasn't. So it was exactly about 1980. Exactly about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're kind of a little bit past the birth of punk. So they came in when punk was in full flow. Yeah, I think it's where we've just read the Blondie book. Yeah, they just and it's after kind that. of just when Blondie hit the mainstream. Mm. So then these kids, the Beastie Boys, were hanging out in CBGBs and Max's Kansas City, yeah. places we've literally just read about in I Debbie know, Harry's book. Of, yeah, we know the world now, don't yeah. we? Thanks and it's to almost Debbie like when Debbie Harry left, these kids came in. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting, isn't yeah. it? That's what happened next. Beastie Boys are the. What's the opposite of a prequel? A sequel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> BC Boys are the sequel to Debbie Harry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the book is. Yeah, We've been lucky recently because we did Bob Dylan as well. Yeah. Which was like 1960s He's New the York. prequel to yeah. Debbie Harry. <laughs> so it's a trilogy. Yes. So in a way, people could listen Bob to... Bob to Debbie to Beastie Bob Boys. Bob to Debbie to Beasties. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That sounded like a rap. All available on our podcast channels, yeah. should you want to treat yourself one afternoon. But it all paints an amazing picture yeah. of New York City before it got gentrified. It's changing during this book. Yes. By the end of this book, it's turned yeah. Not as cool as it was. Yeah. They're still talking about these piles of rubbish and filth and heroin and coke being cheap. It was quite a broke city. Mm -hmm. And there's still all these lofts in downtown where they could just take over huge spaces and play. The when there was that. still an accessible arts scene. Yeah. And music coming out of their ears. There's a hip hop scene. Disco was still going, even though it supposedly killed. There was gay dance clubs. There's reggae. There's people like Tito Puente, the CBGBs, rock and punk, jazz. There's Blondie, Warhol was still about, and Basquiat yeah. was still yeah. painting, graffiti was everywhere. Such a vibrant time, and you're allowed to be a kid and just roam. I just honestly, just having the opportunity as a 15-year-old to be part of that scene, mm. it blows my mind that you could do that as a 15 year old yeah. oh also new york so lawless because america is so cracked down on you can't go to bars before you're 21 yeah right they were 15 going to all these gigs going to bars they were saying when you got real power is when the dj gave you drinks tickets yeah that's so they right. weren't even drinking at 15 in these <laughs> bars and you think america's really strict it wasn't at all in their world so they're getting into the punk scene and they quickly form a punk band. So they're not all together in the beginning. No. So they start a punk band, which is Mike D, Yauk, but there's a couple of other people, John Berry and Kate Schellenbach. Yeah. A woman. Woman Listen. drummer. So they quite soon start gigging and stuff. And then at another gig they go to, there's a punk band called The Young and the Useless. And their singer is Adam Horowitz, Ad Rock. And then eventually... I think John Berry leaves as a couple of iterations of the band, but essentially Ad Rock joins the punk band with Mike D, Yauk and Kate Schellenbach. Yeah. And that's the first iteration of the Beastie Boys, right? But they're still yes. very much a punk yeah. band. They said they all went to see this band called Black Flag play at the Peppermint Yeah, Band. Henry Rollins, yeah. I looked him up. They're absolutely Hardcore. crazy. Yeah. That was where they were all in the room together at the same time. And they said it was a really seminal moment, this gig, because the Beastie Boys potentially formed at that gig because they were so inspired by that band. They were like, we need to be doing this, mm -hmm. this punk thing. We need to let's get together. But also at that same gig, unbeknownst to them, Sonic Youth formed. That would yeah. be, be in their autobiography. Yeah, right. 
this That's black mad. flag gig. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Can I just excuse us for being a little bit confused? Because this book is another one that's oh, written like by... Crew. Yeah, Mike D, then Adam Horowitz. And it begins by saying that almost I feel the reason they wanted to write a book is partly to get it all down because it's history yeah. and partly because it was an ode to Adam Yauk, who died in 2012. Yeah. And they just wanted to dedicate this book so that they got his life written down and gave him all the credit he was due. And there's a real sense of that in this book, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. absolutely love this man. And they say right at the start, it was Yauk who got everything going because mm-hmm. he was such a special person. He was the one that had a crazy idea, but then made it happen. And he made it happen all the time. And he had amazing ideas and made them all happen. And if it wasn't for him... They would have gone nowhere. He was a Jerry Hallowell of the Beast. Yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> and there are lots of little chapters by various other people who pop in and out. So yeah. sometimes it gets a bit confusing what happened when and who said what. Yes. That's okay. just to excuse ourselves. Uh, no, no but it is confusing. Bollocks. No, like the Motley Crue one was confusing. Yeah. So all we need to know then at this moment in time, the Beastie Boys is four people, which is the three Beastie Boys that we know and love and Kate on percussion. Yes. And drumming. Yes. Percussion or drumming or both. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. they're recording music, right? Yeah. So in 1982, they record an EP. <laughs> yeah. The whole thing is on YouTube and each track is like a minute long. And each minute is just like <laughs> an assault of noise. That's very punk, isn't it? <laughs> yes. To do really short songs. Yes. <laughs> but it kind of got them a bit of attention on the scene and people yeah. began to know who the Beastie Boys were. But at the same time, so they're in the New York club scene, underground clubs, punk and stuff, but also hip-hop is ushering in, still very, very underground. They kind of hang out in a hip-hop club and they start getting in to rap, don't they? Yeah, but before that, they're really, really punk. They actually recorded their first single when they were 15, 16, 17, and I thought, wow, I've really got to look at like my mate's kids and stuff who were 15 and think, you could be starting the Beastie Boys. That's how old you are. Yeah. I've got to not think of them as kids, but think right. of them as older yeah. than I think. Yeah. Because they were brilliant at music at that point. I think as well, just because of their location, you know, and they're already hanging out in gigs and stuff. And they're in New York with that amazing music scene. It kind of, I get, I get how things could happen early for mm. those kids with that energy at mm. that time. Yeah, so there's a, there's a chapter about this bloke called Dave who ran the Rat Cage and he was the DJ there. Mm-hmm. And he said, these kids came in, they're just like these scruffy kids. They'd go up to the DJ booth and make some requests. Dave would say, yeah, I'll play all these songs for you as long as you stay on the dance floor when I play songs you don't like. But it lists all the songs you play and it's such an amazing yeah. eclectic mix. Actually, this book is... It's kind of almost magazine-like because there's lots of chapters about stuff, but there's so many lists of the inspirational tunes and the stuff DJs were playing. And I've Googled as many as I can and listened to them. I know a lot of them, but it's a great document of the music of a scene. No wonder, you know, if, if you love music, what a great place to soak it all up. And then you said at the end of every night, they climb all the way up to the booth again and say, thank you. He said, no one ever <laughs> said thanks. So I love these kids. Yeah. It's really good. He says um, he booked Killing Joke for New Year's Eve and no one went. I can't remember. There was some other band that were better at some other place. Everyone went there. So all of the staff got sacked the next day. So then they all spread out to other places. So this bloke went to Danceteria, which is legendary, legendary. for giving birth to Madonna, yeah. basically. And the Beastie Boys went. They had friends then in these key places that would let them in. There's another bit by a DJ called Anita Sarko, who's also DJing at Danceteria, who loves these boys, who lets them in, and she gives them drink tickets. <laughs> Just saying how loved they were, these kids. And then they come in saying this place, Danceteria, was the coolest place because it's 10 floors of mm, building. Oh, it sounded amazing. And there's like a dodgy basement with stuff going on they didn't really know about. There's and a goth floor. There's a goth floor because <laughs> goth was new. Imagine goth being new. Yeah. That's so hard to comprehend. <laughs> but they're all, it's important to say, stoned out of their minds their whole lives. So all through this time, they're really stoned. It's just important to mention that. <laughs> so they're they're just very much immersed on the club scene. Yeah. Right. And they're Okay, so then their second gig 
ever. The singer from a band called Bad Brains comes to it and loves it, and they can't believe someone from Bad Brains has seen them. And he goes up to them and says, will you be our opening act for the closing night of Max's... Kansas City. Yeah, Yeah. which is where Blondie used to waitress and then played a lot at, so we now know about that place. And it's legendary, and they can't believe they're going to get to play. It kind of like playing CBGB's The mm-hmm. Closing Night, sort of similar to that. I now get it, how yeah. important that was. And so they play that, and so they were pretty crap, but they had the time of their lives. But that's amazing for those kids, because they used to go and watch Bad Brains. Yeah. And then on their second gig, to be asked by Bad Brains yeah. to support them. Second gig. And Max's Kansas City, great. And then it says, hip-hop happened. So it literally hadn't happened until that point. And then it came to town. Rocksteady Crew, Africa Bombata, came out of the Bronx and it blew their tiny minds. He says about Africa Bombata, it was like he was the master orchestra conductor and records were the symphony. Just pulling this from there and that from there and conducting it all together... It's like a collage. It's like Andy Warhol mixed with Basquiat. It's, it sounds, though. So those young boys, those punk boys, were slowly discovering hip-hop and yeah. becoming part of the scene, right? Yeah. And they loved it. Because actually hip-hop is quite punk, really. It yes, flies well, in the face of convention, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And I never put the two together, and I never kind of realised that the Beastie Boys were punk and hip-hop. Yeah. Oh, because I always thought I never liked them. But actually, when I think about the songs of the Beastie Boys that I knew, within their recordings, there were definitely punk elements, which I recognise now. Yeah. But what I didn't realise is that later on in their career, where I just assumed I didn't like them, they were actually making... Totally mellow... Well, they don't completely mellow up. (laughs) What you say, just making a whole eclectic mix of sounds. And it's really good. Yeah. So, hip-hop is happening. All right, the first record they made, which is called Cookie Puss, Cookie Puss. which was kind of a joke because it was some sort of ice cream Oh, my God, did you Google the Cookie Puss? The, the song? No, the actual no, Cookie I Puss. the song is based on. So it's actually a dessert made by this local New York company, and it's it's like a sundae, and it's a it's the crappiest thing you've ever is seen. It? It's a face of, like, presumably a cat made out of ice cream, and it's it's just... I can't even believe it was a thing. <laughs> It's so they said in this book there's different ones for different holidays. Yeah, like, but they said it was the same thing, but they just put Irish a different puss colour on for, or something. Some yeah, whatever. There. Yeah. They just put some holiday green. puss. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a legitimate thing that yeah. a local ice cream parlour produced, a cookie puss. This is when you realise that they actually fit into that wider artistic scene of New York, the hip hop, the graffiti, the art, everything, because they're collectors yeah. of imagery. The things they collect are really part of that whole... Like Andy Warhol with a can of soup. They're bringing in yeah, really right. interesting yeah. mm-hmm. things and mixing it into the music. It's part visual, it's part jokes, it's part... Plus, it's everything. Cookie Puss is a really funny name. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> but the song... I, was, I thought it's just going to be laughable. It's a piece of genius. I actually thought this is genius. I thought it was quite crap. I love it because the, they incorporate a phone message as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's naff, but it's punk as well. And yeah, there is a real punk element to it, even yeah. though they're crossing over into hip hop. But the samples and all the sounds yeah. coming in, mm-hmm. brilliant. I they used that really basic nineteen eighties like drum machine as well. Yeah, it's fun. It's exactly what I would expect a seventeen year old to come up with. Yeah. It's funny. I think it's great. And the B side got picked up by BA British Airways and on an advert. Was it Mike D who heard it? Because he said he was just in somebody's house and it came on the telly. Yeah. And he was like, hang on a minute, this is us. This is us. It's our music. It's a revolution. Did you remember who he said had done it? Yeah. Hazy Hazy Fantasy Fantasy had selected the music for the BA advert. How that is weird is nuts. that? Why are Hazy Fantasy recruiting music for BA? I thought about that because immediately I thought that must be Jeremy Healy. He was. We of always think of he Hazy Fantasy. A legendary DJ. Yeah, he did. But we think of Hazy Fantasy as a duo. But actually, they were a trio. But one of them was never on camera. He was oh. the person who masterminded and was a musician and wrote all the mm. tracks. So I think maybe it was him who also did music for a British Airways advert. It kind well, of makes maybe, more sense. Yeah. But yeah, so he picked up on something. 
a B um, side from, yeah. of this cookie puss <laughs> random. How did it even get to Britain? Amazing. Of course, it helps then having fancy parents because it was one of their parents who knew a lawyer who then got onto BA and BA shat themselves clearly and immediately sent them 40 grand, which was 10 grand yeah. each. In the early 1980s. Yeah. And they were teenagers. Kids. I reckoned, reading between the lines, their parents rationed them the money because Mike D who said he went downtown with exactly 250 quid oh, in his yeah. pocket. Now, if you had the full 10 grand, yeah. you might have got a card. Yes. But he had exactly that money in his pocket and went to buy the guitar of his dreams. Turned out he saw this drum machine. It was an 808 drum machine. And it was exactly £250. Yes. And he just went, hang on a minute, I'm having that because I'm pretty sure that's the sound on all the hip-hop records I'm mm -hmm. listening to. Oh, by the way, the one track that they mention like five times is Buffalo Girls by Malcolm yeah. McLaren. So that was hugely influential to yes. the Beastie Boys. It's interesting. Malcolm McLaren, obviously, we don't like him anymore because we've read the Vivian Westwood autobiography. Yeah. But what that bloke did in the music industry, essentially creating the Sex Pistols with Vivian Westwood, we know yes. now. But also in the UK, he really did start bring scratching and rapping to the mainstream, yeah. you know, because he was hanging out. We know now through reading Vivian Westwood that actually they spent a lot of time in New York at that yeah, time. Yeah, New York Dolls, all that stuff. So he would have been going and picking up the early hip hop stuff taking it back to England yes. and therefore repackaging it back to them. So like the Beastie Boys are hearing Buffalo Gals and thinking, what crazy shit is this? Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised that his name come up quite a, a lot, actually. Yeah. Very influential man. Well, it's punk again, isn't yeah, it? Mixing yeah. in with him. It's... So that's a sound that they really wanted to yeah. get was a Buffalo Gals. And it's just one of those swerves. You've got that money and you swerve to there. Yeah. Amazing. The little knock-on effects of one thing after another. Mm -hmm. But that 10 grand each. Yes. A good windfall for them. So, yeah, they got the sound. They started to get the sound they wanted. By the way, that money they got, so they sued. British Airways paid them £40,000, which was $10,000 each. Because let's not forget, there's still four of them in the Beastie Boys, one of which is Kate, a woman. Yes. Just wanted to drop that in before yes, we forget. Yes, it's good to remember that. There's still that. very much four of them. Yeah. And, and they said rap was so new, there was only about one new record coming out every two weeks. <laughs> yeah, right. So, isn't that nuts? Yeah. Imagine... How many is that out there now? Oh my God, the beginning of rap. We'll later come to the beginning of the internet. It's just, oh my yeah. God, everything started once. Well, that <laughs> was in our lifetime. I feel lucky that we've seen the birth of all of these things, you yeah. know? And in fact, I think they say, you know, Blondie did Rapture, where Debbie Harry raps <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on yeah. that song. People say it's the first white rap. But I think in the grand scheme of things, certainly in terms of the mainstream, it's one of the first rap records. Yeah, I think it was. It got Which is a bit a nuts, bit vinyl. really. Yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't count. No, it really no. doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, so in their gigs, they started doing 20 minutes of hardcore punk, then a bit of DJ, and then 20 minutes of hip hop. And that yeah. became their thing. Mm -hmm. So they were really genuinely mixing it half mm -hmm. and half. And then when they're doing the hip hop, they have a DJ as part of their stage show now. And that DJ is actually Rick Rubin. Yeah. Who goes on to form Def Jam Records with Russell Simmons. Yeah. So they're he, all there. He was a university student at that time in New York and they heard that he had some equipment. So they went to his room in his halls of residence or whatever. And they have this argument in the book about did he have a bubble machine or not? They thought he had a <laughs> bubble machine. He yeah. did, in fact, have a bubble machine. It was very important in those days. And so that's how basic it was. He was a bloke who DJed. He was a university student who had a load of equipment in his tiny little room. And he formed Def Jam yeah. Records, which is humongous yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, that's history. Yeah. That's hip-hop history right yeah. there, the right forming there. of Def Jam Records. And they got Beastie Boys on their label right at the beginning. So you think Beastie Boys are signed to Jeff Jam? No. Jeff Jam. Jeff, Jeff Jam. <laughs> That's a good that label. We so just start. Naff. It sounds a bit easy listening. Yeah. Jeff Jam. <laughs> the one thing that surprised me about all of this is that the Beastie Boys are white and hip hop is very, very black. 
And it surprised me that Def Jam in the early stages signed well, white they kids. They were white people signing white kids. It was a white. Rick Rubin was white. Russell Simmons is black. I don't know. Hip hop is essentially, fundamentally, a black underground scene. It absolutely was. And Def Jam, to me, was always a black label with Run DMC. Yeah, LL same here. So I just find it surprising that they decided to sign these white middle class kids. Yeah, do you know what, though? They're real. I saw an interview with LL Cool J actually saying they went into that scene where they were the only white kids playing to black crowds, but they were never judged because everyone recognised that they were real. They were the real deal. And they were really, really good. I mean, punk's white. Punk's traditionally white, Mm -hmm. so I guess they fused the fusion. If you're going to do that by colour, they brought the punk in to the hip-hop. Yeah. They do mention race, though, because they said they do know that they probably got pushed further because they were white and MTV were really racist. So their video got played. Yeah. So it was a way to get that music onto MTV because they were white. So they did get a leg up in that way. Yeah, I did wonder if it was a deliberate contrivance in that there were so many barriers for black artists. Yeah. And they thought, in well, if it was, yeah, if it was white artists to yeah. the mainstream. Although yeah. you do wonder whether that's them doing a disservice to themselves. They definitely gave a nod to how racist MTV were. But fight for your right to party. Reading this again, I realise how kind of kid like it was it was kind of music for really young people for exactly my brother's age for example uh they say it was fun it was actually tongue-in-cheek and they were having a laugh they were joking really the whole personas they created were sort of funny fight for your right to party is an anthem for a certain teenage rebellion from people who weren't the real thing yeah do you know what the whole thing about the beastie boys being white and being that aggressive and basically just some lager drinking idiots, really like frat boys. I think it's a shame because hip hop, black hip hop in the early days was aspirational. Really serious. And yeah. it was telling real stories. Yeah, and it was all about don't take do, what, was the, the, what was the crime. biggest hit of early hip hop? It was white lines, don't yeah. do it. Yeah. And it was to my little 10 year old self. That was like a documentary to me about drugs and why you shouldn't do them. Mm. And then suddenly the Beastie Boys come along and they become the biggest thing in rap. And it's all about getting off your head and shagging women and being obnoxious. Yeah. The white boys came along and subverted early hip hop, not in a good way. Does yeah. that make sense? On the other hand, it's also punk. If you think of it as punk, it's the right attitude. It's yeah. anarchy. They're so labelled as hip hop. I didn't. We should be able to hear the punk and we didn't because they're labelled as something else. It's amazing. So actually, if you take that as punk with the hip hop aesthetic, it actually completely works. But then then when they ended up going out touring with those personas, they actually got sick of it really fast because they realised the whole audience were those frat boys drinking and causing havoc. And they didn't want to be those people anymore. They're like, oh, my God, that's now expected of us to be these twats. Yeah, I think it's that thing where you portray a character to begin with and when that character works and that got you your record deal and it got you on the radio and it got you on MTV and it's all of a sudden becomes very successful. I think it's hard not to do that because it's working. And then you get to a certain stage and you think, oh, fuck, this is not what actually we set out to do. So I watched the Fight for Your Rights Party. Right. I never watched their videos. I didn't see them. They, They might have been on MTV. I didn't have MTV. I don't remember, I'm on top of the pops, I don't remember ever seeing those videos, so I've watched them. And in Fight for Your Right to Party, they're beating up these really square, nerdy blokes. And yeah, that's everything you don't stand for. And in a weird way, now I thought almost existential, like they're beating up the people that they could have been with parents like that, you know. But that's not how you're going to see it. If you're a bully boy, you're going to see it as, yeah, yeah, we should slap pies in the face of these nerds. Yeah, Kate, who was an original Beastie Boy, who by this time is no longer a Beastie Boy, she said when she first started hearing the material they were doing without her, because she knew what they were like and all their songs for her, she said, oh, this is a really good comedy record. She kind of got the joke of it. Yeah, she thought it was a joke. Then as it continued, she goes, oh, they're continuing to do this. They've turned into a bunch of thugs, sexist thugs at that, because they chucked her out of the band. I think that was Rick Rubin. Yeah, well, yeah, when Rick Rubin signed them to Def Jam, 
he's like, you've got to all be a bunch of boys. I get it. I totally girl. get how that wouldn't work with a girl. I do too. Yeah. But it's weird because she says up to that point she wasn't a girl. She was just a person in the band. And yeah, but the world looking into that shame. band, the Beastie yeah. Boys, they can't have a guy. I, no, I, I think it, I think they went about it in a horrible way. And I know for sure from reading this book, they feel terrible about it yeah. in retrospect. But that must have been awful for her. Yeah. She was because they were friends. She was in the band for three years, and she said she'd done a trip around London, and everywhere she went, she was graffitiing Beastie Boys, yeah. NYC, everywhere. That's how invested she was. And then she came back, and she said the three of them, the three boys, were there all in matching tracksuits yeah. with Rick Rubin, and she kind of thought, she "Oh, what's out. going on here?" And then they basically yeah. said, "You're out." Yeah. So she's got her own little chapter where she said they became a bunch of dickheads. <laughs> they came round. They apologised a lot about it. They're full of apology in this book. And then years later, when they got their own label, they yeah. put her band on their Luscious label and Jackson. really promoted yeah. promoted her by yeah. way of apology. So they're signed to Def Jam and they're recording material and stuff. But there are other rap groups like Run DMC and stuff who are bigger than yeah. them, right? Yeah. And then, of course, Madonna at the same time is becoming a superstar. Yeah. And she gets a tour. Yeah, she gets them to be her support band. You know she wanted to run DMC, but they charged her $20,000. That's right. And so then the label Def Jam went back to her and said, you can have the Beastie Boys for 500 500 <laughs> You should have said a grand at least. Yeah. Come on. But again, it's an odd choice because Madonna really had a lot of young girl fans yeah. and a lot of pre-teen fans. And so it's weird to have the Beastie Boys who were this aggressive frat yeah. boy rap group. And they're saying it was weird. Yes. It's them who's saying it. Well, they had so many complaints that um, Freddie DeMann, Madonna's manager, didn't want them to continue yeah, the tour. She, he, she fought And for she them. insisted that they stayed... And I wonder if that is because they both come up at the same time through the same clubs yeah. and they must have had a lot of mutual friends she, and stuff. She probably loved them as well. I bet she loved them and loved their attitude because she's a punk woman. In yeah, the soul. she is really. I forget who writes a chapter in the book, but he says really nice things about Madonna. Yeah, but also she's an artist. And so she'd have probably got their worth. She'd have understood mm. it because she can hear all these amazing influences and that they were an eclectic gatherer of pictures and scenes and sounds and that they were part of the hip-hop scene that she grew up with, with yeah. Warhol and Basquiat. And she's a provocateur as well. And that. And, and they are. So actually, if you are taking your nine-year-old daughter to a Madonna concert, you can't complain no. when the Beastie no. Boys come out and swear a bit. He, They also say they wondered if it was that they made such a horrible racket that was just so pleasant when Madonna came on. <laughs> yeah. Could be. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a mix of all these things. <laughs> But it was great for them. And of course, they learned loads. They were yeah. like a year out with her, were they? Yeah. And then they went straight out onto the, I think it was the Raising Hell tour, which was the Def Jam tour, which had Run DMC and LL yeah. Cool J and the Beastie Boys. So their records aren't getting into the charts at the moment, but they are being exposed to a lot of people on yeah. these tours. Yeah. So people know are beginning to know who they are. Honing their act. I, I really do feel like a lot of people who get somewhere have had their hands held through things because... They got invited to go into the studio when Run DMC were recording. So they just got to watch and learn. Mm -hmm. That's so cool for them. That's a real education. Yeah. So they're recording stuff like hold it now, hit it, hold it now. Yeah, hold it now, hold it now, hold it now. And she's on it. it. Actually, if we think about it, like we all think over here, their big tune is Fight for Your Right to Party. But even she's on it thinking about it that is rap and punk yeah because it has all the guitars and yeah, stuff in yeah. it and now i'm trying hard to remember i'm wondering if any rap or hip-hop songs before the beastie boys actually had guitar in at all because it was all oh, sequences they were just and drum beats yeah. and stuff yeah so they may have sampled some guitar from another record but there certainly wasn't a guitarist in the studio yeah so that um, was the punk element yeah and then when they moved on to make the second record they decided Yes, they went back to playing the instruments only because, well, for the main reason that it would save them a lot of money in <laughs> samples. <laughs> because they were the very well brought up boys that sought out and paid for the people they sampled, which sounds like it isn't a normal thing to yeah. do. Oh, no, when that all first started, the sampling. Nobody cared no. about paying the original yeah. creator of the music. Gosh, it was rife. I think even some of the big hits at the time, 
uh, you weren't even crediting the samples, let alone no. paying them. I think that at some point there was probably a court case. I wonder if it was pump up the volume by Mars. I remember there at some point there was a massive court case about somebody who'd been... It was Stock Aiken and Waterman was with it? pump up the volume. But that happened at the end of the 80s. It was happening a lot before anybody actually got sued for well, it. Well, I do know that Nile Rodgers was invited to go downtown to where the hip-hop was growing out of nothing and witnessed this whole huge scene where they were doing Rapper's Delight to good times. And he was like, this is absolutely amazing. I'm so happy. This is amazing. This is happening. And went away straight away and went to lawyers and went, I need money. I need money for that because that's our music. And I think they got 50% chic of all the royalties from Rapper's Delight, which they should have. But he was on it straight away. But that... That's less beyond sampling. Of, yeah. That's completely wrapping over music. their music. Yeah, 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 so I totally get that. As way. opposed to this tiny little snippet. Which of... is also, when you're sampling, you're distorting it, you're scratching it. Yeah, that's it. true. I mean, arguably, some people who get sampled should just shut up because it's not even that yeah. obvious that they're being a sample. Oh, my God. Some of the things they say they nicked from, there was a bit of Guys and Dolls in, <laughs> in like, Paul Revere, which is a really famous Beastie Boys so I, I need to have a listen... I need to get someone who knows that to tell me what bit. And something else from company. These are musical theatre things. Never would I have guessed. Yeah. But, oh, the way they describe their whole life collecting vinyl, you know, especially that story when they were on tour to Kansas. Ad Rock, I think it was him. He'd go through the phone book and find the second-hand record shops mm. in wherever they went. Mm-hmm. That was how they saw the city. Mm-hmm. And then he found this giant warehouse absolutely packed full of the most amazing vinyls and, and the bloke shut the shop and said, come to my house, let's just listen to records. And he didn't even want to tell the others because he wanted them all. They're like major collectors of everything you've never heard of just to find that two seconds. Mm-hmm. This is how they're so good. Obsessive. It is an art. I'm, people can be really snobby about things like hip hop and sampling, but really, there's such a straight line between that and what Bob Dylan was doing. Yeah, actually, he was going to people's houses, yeah. listening to their record collections, and then learning a part yeah, of Woody from Guthrie his ears, or something. Yeah, yeah so he's so a human a, sampler. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly the same yeah. type of thing, just carrying but through. They're collaging rather yeah. than painting from. They're collaging. Yeah. It's like, it is a colour. They are musical colours. All art is derivative, right? Even oh, if yeah. you want to go back to like Van Gogh, some of his paintings were from sketches that other artists mm. had done. So he was borrowing. Some of his paintings were done from engravings, which were in magazines and stuff. Mm. People don't realise where they came from in the same way that people might not know where a sample comes from. It's always It's happened. the whole journey. It's yeah. the journey of humanity. How This comes in there, that affects that. That one song changed that. Mm-hmm. That's why it's so interesting, isn't it? Technology comes in and everything. It's interesting to me how the BC Boys were seemingly the first people who fused hip-hop and punk metal. Perhaps the most famous one is Run DMC and Aerosmith, and they talk about that in this book, Walk This Way, where I think Run DMC were sampling yeah. the guitar lick and the chorus. But then they said to Aerosmith, do you want to come yeah, and actually play on, and it. Play on yeah. it? I mean, it's a fantastic and track. And the Beastie Boys said, hang on a minute, we want a bit of that. And they went to the studio to they watch did. it happen. Yeah. They're going, Steve Tyler, look at that old man with these silk <laughs> scarves. Old man, this is in the 80s. It's probably about 25 or something. <laughs> I agree with what they say in this book, is that Aerosmith take credit for bringing Run DMC to the mainstream. Yeah, they were already there. They were already there. And if anything, yeah. Aerosmith were kind of over exactly. at that point. Exactly. It's the other way around. Run DMC revived Aerosmith's career. Yeah. Yeah. I but it's a, it's a great partnership. It's a fantastic it's tune. It's great. Yeah, it There's really so is. There's so much collaboration in this, isn't it? But I wonder whether that would have happened were it not for the Beastie Boys, who were under Run DMC. Actually... But the... Run DMC were, would have been exposed to the marriage of hip-hop and punk through the Beastie Boys. And I wonder if that oh, inspired yeah. them to get walked this way Rick going. Rubin to think that that was a yeah. good idea because yeah. it was him. Yeah. Anyway, this is a really cool bit. They go to London on tour and they've never been to London. They say this is actually not just a great night, but one of the greatest nights of all of their lives wow. ever. They're massive Clash fans. They saw them play in New York mm-hmm. in 1980. And they go to Mick Jones's house. Someone's in the record label oh, goes, yeah. Do you want to go to Mick Jones's house? Yeah. 
So they go to his house and they're all getting along great and they're having a beer and it's the afternoon, they're getting a bit pissed. And then Joe Strummer turns up. They're like, <laughs> fucking hell, you can imagine. And then the doorbell rings and this is to quote, fucking Johnny fucking rotten. <laughs> yeah. They're drunk and freaking out. <laughs> They're really new to being famous. I love how they cite the Clash as an influence. And when you think about it, the Clash came up through punk, like the Beastie mm. Boys did. Yeah. But actually, they hopped genres a yeah, bit. Yeah, they did. I wouldn't think of them as punk. Don't oh, know really? What I okay. think punk rock, rock. I don't know. Yeah, they were experimental, especially their yeah, later yeah. stuff. But I didn't realise that until I read this book, actually just how similar the Beastie Boys and the Clash are whilst being quite different. But whilst them. punk is such an influence, they also say they grew up on the Jackson 5 and Stevie Wonder and, you know... It's everything, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Eventually it all comes out if you get all that. I've got three of their albums. I'm now wishing I had at least two others. They're saying to the five brothers wasn't their best work, and I think that's great. So Uh, imagine how good the other ones are. Wow. Anyway... Do you know, I remember yeah. at the time, obviously growing up in England, I remember when the BC Boys came over to tour and I remember what they talk about in this book. I remember how our tabloid press crucified Do them. you? In that first tour when they got busted in Liverpool, that bit becomes so a bit So I, d- I didn't know that this gig in Liverpool got really out of control no. to the point they had to stop it. And then a woman in the audience got the police on Ad Rock yeah. because she said that he threw a can in yeah. her face yeah. and he was arrested. I mean, this blows my mind. The Beastie Boys are over here on tour. Ad Rock is arrested and taken into custody for, for like four. three days. Yeah, four. they're treated like really badly. But I wonder how the record company didn't have the money for the lawyers to go in and say this is outrageous. Yeah. Why was he in there for three I know, it's days? it's nuts, isn't it? And then <laughs> when, when he went to court... The girl just said, well, I can't actually remember what happened. Yeah, and he didn't throw anything at me and it all got dropped. I mean, that's outrageous. Don't you wonder whether they were trying to bring them down because the government might have thought they were a threat or inciting people. like they did with punk. Yeah, Yeah, so they pay somebody to say that. So they painted really badly and they still thrived because it really isn't who they are at all. No, but we didn't know that. And this is my problem with the Beastie Boys is they had this... We know now that a lot of famous people, a lot of rock stars, have a persona when they get on stage. It's a character. And the Beastie Boys very much had that. We find out through this book they're very nice middle-class kids, actually, who have a a wide variety of friends and they're cultured and stuff. But this whole first wave of Beastie Boys international success, for want of a better word, they're kind of thugs. They're real... They seem like it. Being stoned is way more their thing than drinking. And we all know that stoners are much more peaceful. But than alcoholics the persona or... that you've got to fight for yeah. your right to party, they're drinking beer and they're crushing that is, beer cans that's and the stuff. Persona, and and yeah. that's the crowd that they picked and up. Actually, yeah. They tire of their persona, yeah, right? Yeah, they're really is... aware of what it's doing. But the record company is kind of because it works so oh, well. Oh, and they sell a mint. I mean, it's hugely successful. It's massive. I think it's something like 11 million copies shifted yeah. worldwide. The record company work them, they're touring oh, everywhere. Yeah. I didn't know that they fell out with Rick Rubin and Def Jam Records. And Def Jam... Jeff Jam. (laughs) Jeff Jam. Tell me if I misunderstood this. But did they leave Def Jam with no money? Yes. Wow, because Rick Rubin did them for breach of contract because they didn't fulfill their second album. And they were like, you've had us on the road for two years promoting the first album. We had no time. Yeah. To record so you knew that you yeah. were working and now you're saying to us we've breached our contract only because of the workload you yeah, gave us yeah. i'm amazed that they had that massive worldwide hit album and they left that record company with no money yeah it's shit the record company fucks everyone and that isn't even some fancy record company it's just this bloke they knew who was a student and they came up together Def Jam went on to massive things, and I bet it's because... Because they had a mint from the Beastie Boys. From the Boys. Beastie Boys. Yeah, they will have laid the foundation stone for the success wow. of them. Yeah, it's crap, though. Yeah, it really is. But anyway, so they sort of broke up, really, after that. So they all went separate ways. Which they needed at that yeah. point. I think it was an important thing for them to do. I think their longevity now yeah. is because they went their separate yeah, and ways. and they came actually. back together because they wanted to. Yeah. Not because someone was pushing them back yeah. together. And they all drifted to LA and they were going to pool parties and having loads of fun. And then they started working on their second album because they signed to Capital, which were based in LA and that's why they went there. And then they were sort of shifting around, go to this fancy recording studio and that. It was costing thousands a day. 
and they didn't have the nous to say, no, we don't want to do this. So it wasn't really happening for them. Nevertheless, they put together Paul's Boutique, which was their second album, which didn't go anywhere because Capital decided not to promote it in favour of Donny Osmond's album, yeah, right. which is ridiculous. But it is cited as probably their best work and a really seminal work of hip hop mastery mm-hmm. in that time. They were more experimental, right? Really experimental. Is this the one they worked on with the Dust Brothers? Yeah. I think it's kind of to get away from that. Not Well, it killed their frat boys yeah. scene and everything and that persona. So that was good. Yeah. They all got a house together on Mulholland Drive. <laughs> they said, if you imagine Dolomite's dream home, that's what it was like. <laughs> Amazing. And one of them got the pool room. Which was actually... I think that that was a window. Yeah, the the whole fourth wall was a window under the pool. So you could see people swimming around. (laughs) I think he said one of them, the one who had that room, would be asleep and the others would dive in the swimming pool and bang on the window (laughs) to try and wake him up. I've never heard of that That's absolutely amazing. I want one. It's like a zoo. I want a house that has a window into the (laughs) swimming pool. (laughs) All right, so they're kind of making music, being experimental, taking their time over stuff now, and they're releasing albums over a period. They don't have the pressure of the record company that wants them to have massive worldwide success anymore. So in a way, they're still with a major label. Yeah, they're still with Capital, and they're not promoting that album, which gives them the freedom to just carry on. One of them starts a skate clothing company at this point, doesn't mm-hmm. particularly make any money, but clothing is such a big part of their scene. And yeah, you're right, you mentioned, did my brother have a VW? <laughs> they don't even mention that. They don't mention book. that. They don't even mention it, but let's mention it. They were really legendary for having a big chains that had VW car symbols on them, which started a massive trend of people ripping them off the cars. Which started, I think, the technology of cars making their symbols on the front go down into the car at night. So they can't be taken off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. that's a thing now. And yes. I think that's because of the Beastie Boys. Because <laughs> <laughs> it really was a thing. Yeah, I remember there being a big thing in the press about how all VW cars were getting their emblems yeah. torn off. Yeah. So hip-hop people could wear them. Yeah. Yeah, they don't mention that in this Don't book. mention it. But it was a thing. Yeah, it was a definitely So basically, their clothes and style were a big part of mm-hmm. the band. That's the point. Anyway, yeah, they thought, well, we're free to just do what we want to do. So they took their money and got a studio. They're like, don't want all this fancy stuff. We want to take control of ourselves. And they were brilliant for that. They found a divey part of L.A. that was a bit out of the way. Got this big warehouse that had a parquet floor. They mentioned this parquet floor a lot. And they did it all up and they had walls put in and they they put a skate park in and they put basketball hoops, video games. It was like they made it a place that would be really fun to hang out and really creative as well. Mm -hmm. And they could make as much noise as they want because it was out of town a bit. And everyone was turning up, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and LL Cool Jane, hang out and add a bit of music and experiment here and there. Anyway, they created this really creative space for people to call by and for them to hang out. Mm -hmm. They were there all the time for quite a few years just making music and putting their own label together yeah it's all about like collaboration and creativity that's what i got from this book that i didn't get from them as people before i read this book the message i was getting from the beastie boys is something that i didn't think i was into Mm. but reading about their process and stuff you kind of think oh god they are actual genuine artists artists." yes And they're so open to new things, like they were one of the first bands to have a website and they figured out how they can market themselves through that to the point where you couldn't really because nobody had the internet. And even to the point where I think it was some song lyrics or song chords or liner notes on the website and they would have to say, oh, if you don't have a printer, you can send in an envelope and we'll send them They said that. Yeah, they said if you send in a... An envelope with a stamp on it will send you a lyric sheet. They didn't expect the amount they got, so they had to actually employ someone. Can you imagine? Initially, they were sending them. Finally, they had to employ someone to do it, and they accidentally realised they created a database. Yes. So then, when they started making their own magazine, which was like a punk Mm hip-hop magazine... And they got Q-tip in it. George Clinton from mm-hmm. Parliament Funk was doing the artwork for it. It's amazing. And all these articles, they got to drama Kate and her band yeah, in it and yeah. stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And then they had a database to send it to. They were really taking control 
other stories of bands that are getting ripped off by the record labels, they were taking control of themselves. Because they had been ripped off. They had. And or so... disregarded for, what's his name? Donny Osmond. Donny Osmond. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't going to happen twice. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. They're like... <laughs> no, they're just doing stuff in their own terms. They're making the stuff they want to make. Yeah. So they get a run of really good albums now, right? Yeah. Like Ill Communication. Are we there yet? Hello Nasty. Yeah. I think after License to Ill, which was a big hit album, the couple after didn't really do as well. But now Ill Communication, Hello Nasty, they're getting number one albums again. Yeah. Ten years after License to Ill, they are just a real established band yeah. with a massive fan base now, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they are. They moved back to New York. That's important because they realised that New York had changed quite a bit since they were gone. And they set up another studio there. And I love the story of Lee Scratch Perry because they're a massive fan of his. It's Halloween and it's absolutely rammed in New York. So they decide to go and get him and they actually have to escort him on the underground. Uh, what's it called? Subway through New York and then walk him through the mayhem. But... They describe his outfit and this massive hat with bits of broken glass all over it and all this. That's his normal yeah. outfit. In Halloween, New York, he totally blends in. <laughs> they said the seas parted and Lee Scratch Perry walked right through. <laughs> and he just, it's really cool. And he just comes in and lays a bit of stuff down and then goes away and they make this amazing song. But they also describe Lee Scratch Perry. They said, just like us, Lee Scratch Perry wanted the sound of his final finished record to be nothing like it was when it was live. Mm -hmm. So they'd record it live, and then he'd mix it and scratch it and warp it and add this and add that to make something completely different. And he was a massive inspiration in production to them. I never knew there was a connection there. Mm -hmm. It was really cool. <laughs> and we need to throw in a bit about Adam Yao, who he was as a person with all of his hippie stuff he went traveling a lot mm -hmm. they were saying they really admired him because whilst they were just getting stone making amazing music he discovered traveling to india and nepal and found out about the plight of the tibetans and the free tibet movement and then did a lot about it he didn't just talk like they say he put on a massive concert two-day concert which was the biggest one post live aid at that yeah, point yeah and brought loads of bands together the first one was in golden gate park in san francisco and then one in new york and they were giving royalties to tibet as well yeah right? yeah, yeah and really making everyone aware of the situation and then at the same time he discovered snowboarding in utah it was just a real free spirit yeah he's the older one right the, yeah the kind of got things going in the beginning yeah i totally get how his death 10 years ago has impacted them so much that they still find it difficult to talk about it. yeah they say it's he died of cancer and it's too sad to write about. Yeah. They, that's all they say. Yeah. 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 Can I tell you my favourite thing yeah. about Adam Yauk is when they played Madison Square Garden and they wanted to film it. And instead oh, yeah. of getting in like a professional crew to actually film the whole thing professionally, Adam Yauk went to the local store in New York and bought 50 video cameras. This is such a great idea. And then they got 50 random fans coming in. He gave them a camera and said, film the gig from your perspective. Yeah. And they said they couldn't believe it, but they actually did get 50 video cameras Every back at the end of the night. Every single one back. Yeah. yeah. And they got all the footage together, and he said the next day, Yauk took the 50 cameras back to the <laughs> shop and got his money back. <laughs> uh. That's Brilliant. That's good entrepreneur behaviour, that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything about that is great. Yeah. And he said it's the best captured film because it's from the fans' yeah, perspective. So some of it's of them, but some of it's of someone sat stoned on the floor laughing or whatever. <laughs> it's the whole mishmash of what it actually is like yeah. to be at their gig. Yeah, brilliant. God, there's so much stuff to listen to and watch just yeah. come out of this. Documentaries that were made that need to be seen. One of the albums they did... Was it mix-up? It was mm. just purely instrumental. Yeah. So even, you know, 10 albums in, they're still trying new things and yeah. doing what they want to do. Yeah, exactly. Do. You know how they talk a lot about making mixtapes and how important that was to them? I made a mixtape once for my mate Kate, and it had all Beastie Boys. But it's I... not much of a mix-up. No, no, it must have been all Beastie Boys. I just made, you know, I used to do the same. I used to make mixtapes yeah. for mates. 
just to share music, didn't you? Yeah, of course. It was yeah, we did that. Yeah. You know, I made you a mixtape. It's yeah. a nice thing to do for yeah. mates and stuff. Sure. My particular mate, Kate, this particular time, she could not believe that this instrumental stuff I put on there was the Beastie Boys because I put in a lot of their funky instrumental stuff. Mm -hmm. And she said she had it on, in her car all the time, saying to people, guess who this is? Because she was so impressed. <laughs> and she could get one up on them because no one would believe. This whole book, I felt, was a bit of a mixtape, actually. Yeah, it actually it's really is. Very, I mean, obviously, we've talked about their story, but within this book, there's so many lists of musicians. There's even recipes and stuff and yeah. all the photos. It's a real document of their lives and career. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? They've gone above and beyond in the world of autobiography. You know how Bob yeah. Dylan like gave us like nothing? He's, Bob Dylan yeah. reluctantly told us about three parts <laughs> yeah. of his massive career. I feel with the Beastie Boys, they've literally told us almost yeah. everything they've that happened. They've captured the time. They've captured how annoying it was to have to take tapes around in your pockets all <laughs> yes. the time. yes. And there's a lot of stuff that's technical that music people will be really interested in. Yeah. Literally looping tape. Actually physically oh my looping God, it. Oh, God, when they, he looped it around his <laughs> kitchen. And I <laughs> think he got one of those old reel-to-reel tape machines. And I think he put a broom over there yes. and another thing yeah. over there. And he literally, to literally took the loop, the loop the tape. out. That's... And it was like rhyming and stealing or something. That was the, yeah. that was the basis. It's amazing. Yeah. I love this book. Yeah, it's a masterpiece of a book. Yeah, it really is. It's and a I, mega mix. Yeah, we've been really fortunate lately about, like, with the Debbie Harry book, making yeah. us feel we were in 70s punk New yeah, York. Yeah, we've had Now, a... the Beastie Boys have made us feel like we've been in early 80s Yeah, and New I've York. always wanted to be transported to the, all these yeah. eras of New York. Yeah. And I do think New York isn't what it was. I'm sure you can find what you need to find. But it, No, it's the same it, as London. Look, they've, we've both... they've gentrified it and pushed it all out. These are such a creative time. And I love that these boys' parents let them become the Beastie Boys. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well done, parents. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thrift Shop Biography. We love making this podcast and we're absolutely thrilled that so many of you are already listening. Um, we're new to this and you could really help us out by leaving us a review somewhere, wherever you listen to this podcast. And if you could share us, tell your friends about us or drop some links on social media. We have a Facebook page called Thrift Shop Biography. So make sure you come over there to hear about the episodes first and what else we're up to. OK, see you next week. And if you're new here, there are loads more episodes now to go and listen in the back catalogue. So make sure you go and enjoy them. OK, thank you very much. Bye.